morning. I'd like to call this special PA committee meeting to order. And uh, Councilmember Rue and myself uh, are present. And I'd like to ask that we take items one, two, three, and six on consent without objection. Sure. And then uh, are there any public comment cards? Uh, there are only two public comment cards on item number eight there, sir. So no general public comment. But no general public comment. So with that, general public comment is closed. And uh, let's start with item number four. Item number four, communication from the mayor relative to the exemption of one principal project coordinator for the emergency management department from the civil service pursuant to charter section 1001B. Have anyone here representing the department to speak on this item? If not, we will hold this item and see if uh, someone appears later. Item number five. Item number five, communication from the mayor relative to the re-exemption of one public information director position, class code 1800 for the Department of City Planning for the Civil Service pursuant to Charter Section 1001B. Good morning, council members. Good morning. Jan Zatorski, Deputy Director, Department of City Planning. We have put in a request to exempt this public information director position, which we received in this current fiscal year budget, 2016-17, as part of our comprehensive community plan program. Um, we feel that we need to, we have actually gone through the process of certing an existing eligible list. Uh, two candidates reported, and they were not sufficiently qualified for the position level that we're looking for. We're looking for a person that can manage strategic communications for the department, for the various high-level policy uh, programs that we're initiating that have a general plan update, community plan program, as well as our recode, and as well as managing our regular day-to-day -day media inquiries that we get on a regular basis. And I have the director here, Vince Bertoni, for any other questions. Okay. Um, We've had a few recent examples where planning and the city council weren't on the same page. So I have to ask, as this positions, as part of this position's work with the community, will this position coordinate to, with individual council offices and and community to help advance uh, community and council priorities? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Kretz. This, to me, is probably going to be one of the most important positions in our department because I see this as a position that will be overseeing a few other positions in the department that we're going to pull together that bring together both communication and relationships with the city council as well as the communities and the neighborhood councils. So this is the person who's really going to oversee all of that. Now, that one person can do all of that. We'll have some other folks who will work for them that will specialize a little bit more into one person that will deal more with the day-to-day -day communications of, of, of press releases another one that works closely with the neighborhood councils, and then another one with the council offices. So it's going to be, a, if you will, a hybrid between communications and, and, and um, government relations, especially council relations. Um, if you think about it, we'd, we've never had, I think, in the department, at least in the recent history, any position do dedicated to either of those functions, to either communications or governmental relations. If you think about it, we do, the planning department does things that impacts everyone throughout the whole city and especially the council offices. And so what we want to be able to do is be strategic both about the communication that we do so that, that we can communicate with all the community members ahead of time as well as work more closely with the council offices. Well, that sounds like a positive thing. Mr. Rue, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I know we always have concerns about exempt positions, but um, in this case, uh, I concur with uh, with um, with Vince, um, Mr. Bertoni, because um, I, I, I welcome uh, you coming on board. It's been only a couple of months, and um, and uh, we're expecting a lot from you. And we know that we can't 
um, expect a lot from you without support, without you having support, and especially this uh, PIO position, I think, will go a tremendous way. This is something that um, my office uh, felt was needed for a long time. So while I do have concerns about exemption, I think this is a perfect use, and, um, and I support. And um, thank you for all your good work. And I would say ditto, and I would ask that we uh, move this item without objection. Uh, item number seven. Thank you. Thank you. Item right, number seven, communication from the mayor and CEO re report relative to 2016 California Department of Transportation funding for transitional employment services. This matter has also been heard by the Economic Development Committee. Good morning, council members. Kimberly Baker Gilmet with the mayor's office. Uh, Ruben Wilson with the mayor's office. Jason Klein with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Or if you could walk us through this item. Sure. So last year, our office was approached by Caltrans because they wanted to bring a transitional work program to Los Angeles. They have been able to do this uh, for transitional workers who have been formerly incarcerated in other jurisdictions, but they had not yet made a foray into Los Angeles. We were able, through our um, conversations and negotiations with Caltrans, able to negotiate them giving the city of Los Angeles an $8.93 million uh, contract to execute these services down here in Los Angeles for litter abatement. All people who will be enrolled in this program will be people who are on post-release supervision. During the time that they're participating in the late litter abatement, they will also receive transitional work services, wraparound services, et cetera, to prepare them for the permanent workforce. And at the conclusion of the transitional job period, they will be placed in permanent employment. And uh, are we connecting this program with our, our, uh, our local hiring working group and all of our efforts to uh, hire folks from, from the city of Los Angeles in these positions? Absolutely. We have already been in contact with uh, Mr. Portero, and we are going to be having a meeting next week to talk about that further. We're all... Okay. And... Uh, the report describes the litter abatement uh, portion of this program, but doesn't describe the job preparation and job, job placement services to be provided. So uh, uh, can you describe those? Absolutely. So our contractor will be providing some transitional job services such as um, employability skills, job interview, uh, training for being on the job, soft skills, also providing some support around job placement and job readiness, resume preparation, and then also assisting the participants in uh, basically being able to be placed in long-term employment as needed. So there will also be support with housing, other wraparound services, cognitive behavior intervention, etc. And there's a number of similar services that exist in other departments. What's the appropriate place to house this particular program? Well, as Caltrans is uh, very clear that they want all of the participants to be on post-release supervision, which, you know, either on probation through the county or parole through the state, all of them will be formally incarcerated. And that is why they approach the Office of Reentry for this, in the mayor's office, for this particular program. And how is the, will this... Uh, a crossover with the grid program or, or will it? There will not be crossover with the grid program. However, obviously, since many of the individuals who do participate in gain reduction and youth development um, have had some past criminal justice involvement, likely many people who are served in that um, program will be eligible for placement in this one. Colleagues, any other comments, questions? Mr. Harris Dawson, oh, who, who by, for the record, is, is now here. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you all for the report. Um, so on the last question that uh, the Chair put forward around uh, coordination between GRID and uh, this, the Caltrans program, uh, and you talked about there being a lot of eligibility amongst the GRID crowd. Uh, so in, your, um, in your view, what would it take to make the connections? Because uh, one of the things about uh, the grid program, particularly the case management, um, is uh, 
many people, many experts in the community felt like the case management works best when you, when you can offload someone into a job uh, as opposed to just sort of indefinite case management um, until the person, I guess, ages out of it. Um, so what would it, what would need to be provided in order for those connections to be made more deliberately? Absolutely. Well, one of the things that obviously is really important to the mayor's office and obviously to all our council members is that our Angelinos who are at risk of um, being involved with criminal justice have opportunities to be employed. And so one of the things that we will make sure to discuss and require of our subcontractor is that they do make those inroads available. So if we had, we can actually set up something where GRID can specifically and directly refer to the subcontractor and as long as the person is on post release supervision and or has been incarcerated, we can have those slots available. Thank you. We would uh, love to be helpful with that um, because I think being on, um, you know, post-incarceration supervision is one thing, but having been in case management, the significant amount that the city, re, you know, invest in that process, we're building into a person. Uh, so that uh, particular candidate comes uh, with some investment that a random person may not have. Absolutely. Mr. Rue, any questions, comments? Um, I'd like to suggest that we approve the CAO's recommendation, but I'd like to add an amendment that we uh, request the mayor um, and instruct the personnel department to establish a formal coordination mechanism between this grant program and the city's targeted uh, local hiring working group so that we can ensure that successful uh, program participants are given the opportunity to be part of the candidate pool for the trainee level civil service positions within the city of Los Angeles. So without objection, uh, we will approve uh, that item. Uh, item number eight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number eight, continued from March 11th and March 16th, 2016. City Attorney Report and Department of Animal Services Report and Ordinance relative to amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code, Section 53.63, in regard to barking dog noise requirements. Uh, good morning, Council Members. Dove LaSalle, Assistant City Attorney, and with me is uh, Dana Brown, Assistant General Manager of the Department of Animal Services. Uh, what this ordinance does, uh, well, let me back up a moment. Uh, the ordinance that had been in effect for about 40 years on barking dogs was changed a few years ago uh, with the idea that perhaps to add additional clarity that, so that the definition of excessive barking would be either continuous barking for 10 minutes or intermittent barking for 30 minutes during a three-hour period. What the department has found during that period of time was this def definition simply does not work. Uh, number one, most people do not read the law, so they do not spend the time um, counting the minutes. Uh, number two, five minutes of continuous barking in the middle of the night uh, is enough to be considered excessive barking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so at the department's request and at the commission's request, uh, we removed that time period and in the interest of providing some guidance to the hearing examiner on the definition, uh, we put in <coughs> factors that the department may consider uh, when it concludes that something is excessive barking. Um, there's also one additional change, and that was a typo several years ago when we made the, uh, the, the change to this uh, section. Um, the, uh, the typo was that the second complaint should be filed after uh, rather than within 15 days. And so that's just being corrected now so that the second complaint has to wait 15 days, which was the rule for 40 years. Uh, but was accidentally changed when we made these other changes to the, uh, to the uh, uh, existing code. We're both here to answer any questions. And what happens to uh, dogs in the worst case scenario if uh, they aren't able to stop barking and, and so, nothing is resolved? 
Uh, normally, the, it's a uh, multi-step process. Uh, the first step in the process when the department receives a complaint is that they will generate a letter to the dog owner uh, letting them know that uh, they've received complaints, that the dog is excessively barking. And I'm told by the department that that letter usually solves 75% or so of the problem uh, complaints. Of the 25% uh, left, if after several weeks the department continues to get complaints, uh, the next step is an informal hearing at the local animal shelter with one of the um, uh, animal control officers, uh, with the dog owner, with the complaining parties. And that normally takes care of the remaining 90% uh, of excessive barking cases. There's a small percentage where those two steps do not solve the problem. For that, the department sets a formal hearing, also in front of a hearing examiner who is a, an acting captain or a captain uh, animal control officer in the department. Um, they listen to the matter, and normally, uh, if they find that there is sufficient evidence to show that the dog is excessively barking, will reissue the license on terms and conditions. And the terms are con and conditions are basically that they comply with the law, although they are more specific. For example, if the evidence showed that the dog is usually in one part of the backyard or it's, when it's in the backyard it makes noise, then they may require that the dog be kept indoors between, say, 11 p.m. and uh, 7 a.m. Um, whatever it takes to try to match the terms and conditions, to what the perceived problem is. Um, on a first time hearing, uh, there is no revocation of license. There is always a reissuance of the license on terms and conditions. Uh, there's no additional cost for this. It's, it's simply, sometimes it requires training. Sometimes there's a dog collar involved. Uh, sometimes it's keeping the dog indoors for certain periods of time, et cetera, et cetera. And are, are there ever times where nothing works? Yes. And what do you do then? And uh, so first, if the dog owner is unhappy with the outcome of the hearing, uh, the LAMC allows them to appeal the hearing to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, they must do this within 15 days. There's a, there's a uh, set process. Um, and so number one, if the person is unhappy, they do that. Uh, oftentimes, hearing from the commission is enough to solve the problem. Uh, in a very, very few instances, I would say probably maybe less than 24 a year, um, we have repeat offenders where even up to this point, uh, we get complaints again that the dog is still barking excessively, there is still a problem. Um, then there is a second hearing. Uh, in front of a hearing examiner. And at that point, if it's determined that uh, the dog is still barking excessively, after all of the warnings, and usually it means that the owner of the dog has also disregarded or disobeyed the terms and conditions, um, the hearing examiner may recommend to the general manager that the license be revoked. And in such case, the dog either has to be remanded to uh, the department, in which case it will be adopted out to someone new, or the owner can keep the dog but must remove the animal from the city of Los Angeles. And that uh, order of the general manager is also subject to uh, appeal to the Board of Commissioners. So when, when uh, worst, worst case scenario with an uncooperative owner occurs and it's remanded to uh, the shelter. Um, right. Or, in, or just removed from the city. Right, but if, if that the removal from the city is the owner's action, if the owner is completely uh, unresponsive, then we obviously wind up with the dog in the shelter. Well, the owner at that point has a choice. The owner turns the dog over to us, or the owner removes the dog from the city and notifies the department exactly where the dog is, 
um, and then there's an obligation to just continue if the dog gets moved from there to tell the department where the dog is. For an owner that is completely uncooperative, the department can, can go in and uh, essentially pick up the dog and take it to the shelter. Um, or and, and you know what, what I'm getting at. So the, the animals that do wind up in the shelter, which is obviously not going to be a huge number, um, do they get euthanized or do they no. actually get a, a chance to be adopted? Oh, absolutely. They get a chance, a big chance to be adopted. And there's and a if they are adopted, obviously, you have to let people know that they have a barking problem. So. And the department does. Yes. So. And oftentimes the dogs can be perfectly good dogs, but either because of where they're kept, um, perhaps they're not walked very often, uh, perhaps they're kept in the front, uh, front lawn. Um, oftentimes dogs kept in a front lawn where there's a lot of foot traffic will feel protective and will bark excessively. Um, oftentimes a new owner um, with training, etc., can turn what was a problem dog uh, simply because of barking, not because of any kind of a nature, uh, into a perfectly fine uh, pet uh, that will continue living with another owner for the rest of its life. So uh, that, that's probably my biggest concern with this, is that at the end of the day that an animal that isn't necessarily deserving of the problem that may be caused by, by the owner and their lack of, of uh, intelligent handling of, of the animal um, gets every chance to redeem itself like any other animal that winds up in the Absolutely. Shelter. Absolutely. Um, yes, and there is a recognition, especially since the animal wasn't turned over as a result of being uh, dangerous or vicious, etc. There's really a recognition among the department staff that oftentimes these barking problems uh, can be solved by a different owner. And uh, it seems like this takes a, a pretty balanced approach by take, listing a number of factors that the hearing officer can take into account. Um, so these factors are permissive, correct? Yes. They have the ability to use yes. their, their judgment to, to make a decision based on these factors. Yes. Um, and they'll have the opportunity to weigh all issues uh, available to them when they make a determination. Absolutely. Okay, other questions? Comments? If not, we have two speakers. First speaker is Maria Tosher. Is it Marla or Maria? Marla. Good morning. My name is Marla Tauscher. I'm an animal attorney. I practice primarily in the area okay, of animal control law. Uh, before you start, uh, two minutes for each speaker. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just want to say that uh, right now you have a very clear law with clear definitions. Your problem is not in the definitions. It's in the implementation and the application of this law. Um, the, the proponents of this uh, definition change are people who do not regularly attend your administrative hearings, which at best are farcical. Um, sadly, the results are not. They end up with a lot of dead dogs. Your hearing examiners are animal control officers with absolutely zero, zero, education or training in the law and due process requirements under the Constitution. That's where your real problems lie. Leaving this to their subjective judgment is a terrible idea. Already for dangerous dogs, you have 53.34.4, which outlines it sets forth at least 11 or 12 different factors to consider. I guarantee you none of them are ever considered. I do these hearings frequently. Um, the commission is equally bad. They act as a rubber stamp. It used to be a decent process, but you haven't had a hear decent hearing officer since George Mossman retired about five years ago. Right now, the hearing officers that you have, I have currently four lawsuits against the City of LA and Department of Animal Services, and the only reason I don't have more is because people don't have the resources. These kinds of laws typically adversely affect low-income and minority communities that can't afford attorneys. Also, these laws, especially the barking dog ordinance as it is, is used, it's weaponized by neighbors who 
don't like each other. As it is, it requires uh, complaints from two different neighbors, but that's not the way this is applied. It takes one complaint from one neighbor who's usually angry at another neighbor, and the department allows itself to be used as an instrument of this sort of tormenting one other neighbor. I've been in hearings, I was in one two weeks ago, where someone will bring in a seven second video or audio that doesn't show the dog or identify the dog and they'll say, yep, that's my neighbor's dog and that's enough for your hearing officers. They are not qualified to use their judgment. They have no training or education in law and more importantly, due process. This will invite more lawsuits against the city. It is a terrible idea. Leave it as it is. If they, would you change the definition of rape if you couldn't get enough convictions, or would you figure out what you need? Thank you. Uh, Alexa Bold. Good morning. Um, I am a victim of uh, nuisance barking. So I'm actually here asking you to please approve the amended language. Um, that's in the, uh, that you have in front of you. Um, the current 5363 that we've lived with for five years is awful. It only def it limits a barking nuisance to two specific things, which is just not fair to the community. The proposed language um, is clear. It's fair to both parties and will be great for the community and animal services. I have been through the process twice. I actually have to disagree. I think the animal services hearing officers were very fair. Um, they didn't favor in front of me. They, they made me go through hoops. Um, it is a problem, yes. But by the time you get to that point, um, they will listen to you. I find that the law is more for n bad dog owners than it is for a bad dog. It's not the dog's fault. It's the dog owner's fault. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, Josh Liddy. Hi, uh, Josh Liddy, LA resident. Um, I'm against this, this proposal to change the law. The current law is written narrowly for a reason. Um, you, you as a department or the Department of Animal Services or whoever's above them are supposed to be able to prove things. Um, it's not the other way around. The burden of proof shouldn't be shifted from the department or from the city to the owner to prove that their dog didn't do anything. Um, this new language is not clear. Um, it, it makes everything very vague, very sub subjective. Evidence basically becomes essentially hearsay. Um, so creating 20 more subjective reasons to impound uh, a dog or take someone's pet only to then try to rehome the pet and think that that dog is not going to potentially be killed in the shelter is a little naive and not very smart in my opinion. Um, uh, the government shouldn't have this kind of power. The police shouldn't have this kind of power. Uh, and I don't know why anyone thinks animal control should have this kind of power. Um, my guess is only they think they should have this power and they're attempting to just give themselves whatever they want with no oversight. We have no oversight of the animal control um, department. The commission is a complete joke and we need something better than what we have currently. Um, with the dangerous dog directive that took place last year, that was really bad and very subjective as well. This reminds me a lot about, of, of that. Of that. Um, when that was being rolled out and animals were being affected, LA, LAS did not uh, respect the legal process. They didn't adhere to proper timing or notification for people. And it's just a constant due process end around. Um, like I said, it, it, it shifts the burden of proof to the owner. You guys are supposed to be able to prove, prove things. That's why the law was written how it was. Keep the language, it's specific. These changes are not specific, they're the opposite. And it's just creating a layup for the department and that's not fair for the community. Thank you. I wonder if we could have staff come back up. I wonder if you could uh, respond to the concerns uh, addressed by the folks that are opposed to this change? Well, one of the things that I want, I'm sorry, Dana Brown, Department of Animal Services, and one of the things that I'd like to point out is that, at least in my experience, most of the revocations uh, for barking dogs do end up in replacement of the dog by the owner. Um, owners, we, rarely do we have to seize animals that are 
uh, re revoked for barker, barking reasons. And uh, we also have something in place where the owner can uh, speak to the general manager about the possibility of getting another dog. Uh, it's because sometimes it, it has to do with the, the, the quarters that the dog is kept in or uh, sometimes dogs are, are alone in the backyard. Just various things that, um, that don't work for one particular animal that might work for a different one. So we have some measures in place to try to keep uh, pet owners, people who want to be pet owners, to try to keep them uh, with an appropriate pet for their situation. And so if, if they adopt another dog, um, we have a process to try and make that work. But obviously could be problematic because some of the time it's the problem with the owner and not the dog. Right. So uh, when, you, when, you are, when your license is revoked for a barker, then you're not able to have a dog for one year. But that, but that year can be, um, we can make it shorter if you talk to the general manager and have, you know, some sort of agreement that in your particular case that you may get a different dog because it, because it matches whatever your needs are. So we have had that happen, but for the most part, uh, owners relocate their dogs for a year and then they bring them back after a year. Uh, sometimes the problem is, it, you know, changes because wherever the dog was, Maybe whoever had it has is able to sort of train the owner. Well, this is what I do, and I don't have that problem. But then other times, um, the problem does persist. That you know, I'm sure that uh, if we have more people here who are complainants or are or are uh, burdened by uh, nuisance barking, they'd be able to give you a better idea of that. And I should add to that that. Uh, both our hearing examiners and the Board of Commissioners are very much aware of the fact that oftentimes the barking dog uh, problem that's, that they're listening to is also a result of uh, fallout between neighbors. And so they're not blind to that. They listen to that to try to determine is it the dog getting blamed unfairly because there's a fight between two neighbors or is it, in fact, that there is a problem of, of excessive barking uh, that perhaps has now caused these neighbors to be uh, hostile against one another? And um, it, they hear these a lot, including our commission in terms of hearing appeals um, several times a month. Uh, that's just one of the things. It's, it's one of the unfortunate things that comes along with excessive barking. Now the, uh, the the suggestion that uh, well let me let me figure out how I want to ask this question. But it's certainly suggested that some animals are euthanized through this process that shouldn't be. So how do, how do you address that and respond? Well, I don't have any particular numbers on that, but but I would say very, very few. And if they are, they're euthanized based on, you know, population management inside of the shelter. Not uh, they're not deemed dangerous or any any of those those situations that would cause us to euthanize them immediately. So uh, for the small number that actually do come into the shelter and are not uh, rehomed by their owners. Uh, we are able to adopt those dogs out to other families. And we, we still require two complaints from neighbors to, uh, to move forward on, on this process? There's, well, there's quite a bit of, uh, there are quite a bit of things that, are, that happen before we actually get to the hearing process. So uh, uh, generally on a Barker, we have m many, many complainants uh, because you know, whether or not the barking exists, but it, it's usually a, a question of is it inappropriate um, or is it um, excessive, which, is, which are two different things, right? So people are arguing about, well, dogs bark, so is it excessive? Or yes, it's barking, but it's supposed to bark because people are passing by. So, so usually we have many complainants, not just one or two. It, if there's we, usually if a we only have one, will we still take action? 
I think, well, some of the, the lower lying action, like what happens at the, at the shelter, we will intervene in that way. You know, if, if, if a complainant comes back, you know, several times in my neighborhood, this is my shelter and I need you guys' help, then sure, we will certainly uh, have a conversation with the dog owner and try to resolve uh, the matter at that level. Right. The, n the number of complainants is actually one of evidentiary uh, because the code itself says that if the excessive barking interferes with one or more, and so even one person complaining about the dog may end up with a letter, et cetera. But once again, it's, uh, it's very common that if it's one person versus one person, uh, they would need to, the complaining party would need to show a lot of evidence. Normally, uh, as Ms. Brown mentioned, uh, there will be several complain complaining uh, parties about the excessive barking. Uh, and oftentimes what you have is several complaining parties and then on the owner's side, several parties saying that they've never heard this dog bark. Mr. harris Dawson, any questions? Mr. Rue? Just one, one quick question. I, uh, <clears throat> I think this is self. I um, just wanted to make sure. This doesn't apply to commercially zoned pet establishments, right? This is just in, within the neighborhood. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm a... Uh, a little nervous hearing uh, what what we've heard from uh, a couple of the opponents, but uh, I, I will, with with a little bit of trepidation, suggest that we approve the draft ordinance uh, amending the LAMC section related relating to barking dogs. So uh, I will ask uh, that we move this item without objection. Thank you, and I believe that is the last item of business. Four? 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 Oh, yes, we had uh, item number four. Do we have uh, folks present for that item now? Good morning, members of the committee. Anna Burton with the Emergency Management Department. My apologies. I apologize for delaying your processes this morning. Um, the item before you is the request for an exemption for a principal project coordinator. This position will reside within the department and primarily will be responsible for citywide sustainment of our disabilities and access and functional needs efforts that we concluded in 2014. The position was approved last year and we did have um, an employee in place who left in March and so this will be the renewal of that position and we'll hire um, this person to continue with that citywide effort to review and ensure emergency plans include those components necessary to support people with disabilities and access and functional needs as well as to depart other, support other departments in their plannings and their development and update of standard operating procedures. Um, from when we did go through the lawsuit and updated, there were over 200 documents that were reviewed, created, or, and or updated. And so this person, this will be their primary responsibility. Uh, just a technical question. The report states that you'd like to re-exempt a principal project coordinator, but this approval would increase the count of approved exemptions. Usually a re-exemption doesn't increase the count, so is this something we're missing or was it a error in the report? Or? I believe that's the citywide number and I'd have to defer to the personnel department. Okay, so I, I will assume that's an error if, if there's no one here to correct us on that. Well, I think, it's, I think it probably just reflects that as each of these is improved, approved, you know, for all the departments, goes up, goes down, goes up. So it may be that when the prior incumbent left, it, it reduced it, but another department may have oh. been approved in the interim. Oh, okay. Bring it back to the same number. Good. Um, so how will this uh, position uh, coordinate with the City Department on Disability uh, when you interact with disabled uh, access? So uh, the, the person within our department would be assisting uh, EMD in the citywide plans. 
and in terms of specificity related to outreach to those stakeholders, those service agencies, we work hand in hand with the Department on Disability. We would co-chair a committee of those interest and stakeholder groups and would they meet quarterly and we'd be working to get guidance from the, dis the Department on Disability for those legal and those technical issues, but the person within our department would have the expertise on emergency management, so would be able to employ those, um, those specificities, if you will, into the emergency plans, which are our expertise. Very good. Uh, questions, comments? If not, I will ask that we uh, move this item to approve the exemption request uh, without objection. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologize for being late. No and, uh, I believe we have no other business on this agenda, so we are adjourned.